So good to see you. I wish you would take your Bible and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. 1 Kings chapter 17. And one of the greatest pieces of advice that I was ever given when I first started in the ministry was this, and I quote, know your lane. Would you say that with me? Know your lane. In other words, don't try to impress people. Seek after God, find what he is saying, and then get in that lane and drive. And uh, I want to do that with the Lord's help tonight. Now, Obviously, we're not here all that often, and I suppose I could take a message that I've preached before and just uh, hum away on that, but I feel directed of the Lord with what I'm going to speak tonight. And how many of you want to hear what God has to say tonight? Amen. Let's look at the word, and then we will pray and commit this to the Lord in prayer as well. 1 Kings 17 and verse number 1, Elijah the Tishbite who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan, and it shall be, that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens, to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. It came to pass after a while that the brook dried up. Everybody say, after a while. The brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying... Now, I'm going to read a few more verses, but how many in this house tonight are thankful that when the brook dries up, the word of the Lord comes again? We're never without the word of the Lord. When it gets tough, when we go through a valley, the word of the Lord comes again. Verse 9, the word said, Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. He arose and went to Zarephath, and when he had come to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there, gathering of sticks. He called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, Bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. She said, As the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal in a barrel, a little oil in a cruise. I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in, dress it for me and my son, that we may eat and die. Elijah, one more verse, said unto her, Fear not, go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. Can you say Amen. I wish you would just set your Bible down and lift up your hands and then lift your voice up with those hands. And let's invite the Lord to speak to us tonight. We are open, Lord, and we are willing to hear what the Holy Ghost is going to say to us. In the next few moments, I pray that you will drive every distraction out of this church, Lord, and let there be a singular voice from the Spirit that will speak in the life of men and women tonight. Lord, I need you as a minister. I need you tonight. I pray that our hearts, our minds, our spirits will be open to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord in this hour of your church. For that, we're going to praise you and give you all of the honor in the name of Jesus Christ. And everybody say amen. Amen. Shake hands with one more person and then you may be seated in the name of Jesus. Three weeks ago, Stacy and I celebrated my father's 88th birthday. I said, Dad, we'll go anywhere you want to go. If you want to get a big old fat steak, I'll buy you a big old fat steak. He wanted to go to a place that served soup and sandwiches. <laughs> I got off easy that day. But as long as I can recall... My dad has served the Lord. I don't ever remember a day when my father 
did not serve the Lord. Within the context of his 88 years were many wonderful days, many mountaintop experiences, many vacations and great uh, events for us kids and just awesome times. But also, as you can imagine, within the context of eight decades, nearly nine decades of life, there's also been downtimes, sickness, a cancer prognosis in 2011, which God miraculously healed him from. The heartbreak of a prodigal child, downturns in the economy that affected finances, and on and on we could go. Uh, however, uh, he faced situations not unlike what we face, because living for God has a whole lot of normal days. Everybody say normal days. You know what's amazing to me that within the confines of the Gospels in the New Testament, we find about 50 days of Jesus' life talked about. He lived for 33 and a half years. That tells me there's a whole lot of normal days that don't get the press. Are there days when miracles are happening? Oh, yes. Are there days when we go through struggles? Oh, yes. But there are also a whole lot of days that seem to be just normal days. So what does it take to be faithful to God through it all? What does it take to square your shoulders back and live for God on the mountaintop, live for God on the normal day, and live for God even in the valley? Is there some magic potion that we can acquire? Is there some secret so allow me tonight to not just be biographical about my father, but also biblical as well. And I believe that faithfulness in God's kingdom is bound up in two all-important words, simply, God first. Everybody say, God first. The scripture says that he is a jealous God. He does not want to be second place. He does not want to be picked third or fourth. But he said, I am God and beside me there is no other. And so I have made up in my mind, even though it might not be flashy, even though it might not, might not be something that people laud and applaud and commend, I've decided in my mind every day with his help, I'm going to place him first in my life. Because I believe that success in living for God is not an emotion, it's not a buzz, it's not a feeling, it's squaring our shoulders back and saying, Lord, I'm placing you absolutely first in my life. And so let us from this passage in 1 Kings draw truth to help us on the journey tonight. First of all, we have to understand that a less than desirable environment is a tremendous opportunity for God's provision to be seen. I want to say that again. A less than desirable environment in our life is a tremendous opportunity for God's provision to be seen. Have you ever ran into someone, maybe at church or in the store or some fellow believer, and you simply said to them, how's it going, my brother? And you immediately live to regret that question. <laughs> Anybody ever face that? Don't point, but just lift your hand. Because that's just cue for some to start complaining about where they are at. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough friends. And my health isn't what it needs to be. But what we need to understand according to the word of God is when life serves us a less than desirable environment, that is a tremendous opportunity for God to step in in the middle of our reality and show himself to be Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord who is our righteousness. Elijah's key to being sustained in the drought was not his need, but rather hearing and obeying God's voice. 
Notice what the scripture says in verse 3, when the, when the drought came. Here's what the Lord said, verse 3. Go hide yourself by the brook Cherith. Verse 9, arise and go to Zarephath. His miraculous provision was not determined by how needy he was, but how much he heard God's voice and responded to what God said. How many of you know that God's still in control? Anybody believe he's still on the throne tonight? He sits on the circle of the earth, the scripture says. Heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool. He still knows where we're at. So may God help us to hear his voice. And obey his voice. In fact, I said it like this recently to a group of leaders. I said, if I could give you a gift, if it was within my power to give a gift to every person under the sound of my voice, it would be an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to us. To train our ears to get up in the morning to hear what God is saying to us. Because I've lived long enough, I know there's people in here who have lived long enough to know when God speaks, he's never wrong. When God gives direction, he's never out in left field. When God says, go hide yourself. When God says, get up and go down to Zarephath, he knows what he's doing. Amen. Now, Stacy and I live in a wonderful town called Cabot. It's a town of about 26,000 people. And we have a wonderful festival. In fact, that festival, annual festival, will take place one week from this coming Saturday. It is, get ready for this, this is the name of all names for this festival. It is affectionately known as Cabot Fest. Now that's snazzy, isn't it? Somebody thought a long time on that one. And for a number of years at Cabot Fest, it's the second Saturday of every October, and uh, for a number of years our church will have a booth, in fact some of our ministries still have a booth where people can come by and get information, and so you have this wonderful Saturday in the fall in Arkansas where people are coming by and they're getting information on different organizations and they're eating corn dogs and the kids are riding rides and there's bouncy houses and all of that, and then there is every year Probably the largest bingo tent that I have ever seen in my life. It is a main staple of Cabot Fest. In fact, if you ever want to go to the restrooms, the washrooms at Cabot Fest, you have to walk by the bingo tent. And so I remember one year particularly that as I was kind of perusing through the booth area, I thought to myself, well, there's so many people here under this tent. i got to see what's going on. I walked up to the white bingo tent, and there were, yay, hundreds of people sitting at tables, all facing the same direction, and at the front of the tent was about an eight-foot table, and there was a lady that was about 162 years old that was sitting behind the table. She had a big silver hopper sitting on the top of that table. It had little ping-pong balls all in the hopper with numbers and letters on it and a big old handle. And every once in a while, she'd grab a hold of that handle, had a big boom microphone down in her face, and she would get to crank in that hopper. <laughs> Ping pong balls are bouncing everywhere. Directly, one of them would fall out the bottom. Boop. She'd pick it up. B, three. Boy, when people got excited, they start putting little chips down on their bingo card. Some are, are playing four and five cards at one time. They're more than ambidextrous. The longer the bingo game went, the more tension mounted under the tent. And so I'm just a little fly on the wall sitting over there watching all of this slice of Americano, you know, unfolding in front of me. And the longer it went, the more tense it got. And it got to the place where people, as she is cranking the hopper, are calling out to her. Call 071. (laughs) Call B6. As though that would affect anything. Directly one fell. B6 was called. And at the same time, two people yelled bingo. An older gentleman up at the front and a young teenager in the back. 
Now it gets fun. Because the goal is to see which one of the bingo callers can get to that table first. And you got to bring proof. You got to bring your card with all that covered up because you got to prove what's going on. And I'm sitting there watching all of this unfold, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And that sounds so absurd, I'm going to say that one more time. I'm standing at the Cabot Fest bingo tent, and the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And here's what the Lord said. He said, Tim, that's exactly the way some people view my provision. That somehow up in heaven, God's got a big old eternal silver hopper. And every once in a while, he has Gabriel or Michael crank that bad boy up and out pops a ping pong ball. And and Michael holds it up and says, Capital Community Church. (laughs) Woo! You get provided for. No, that's not how it happens, honey. What happens is you and I get up every morning, just like Elijah. We train our ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. When the Lord says go, we go. When the Lord says do, we do. When the Lord says rise up, we rise up. Amen. Miraculous provision is found sometimes in the most undesirable times in our life. It's interesting to me that the Lord said to Elijah, verse 4, it will be that you will drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Verse 9, arise, Elijah, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. See, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Now, let me tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. Somebody that walked in CCC tonight and you need an answer. Can I tell you something? There is a God that's commanding things behind the scenes before we ever get to where the answer comes. If God is powerful enough to command a raven and command a widow to get ready to feed a prophet, he's powerful enough to walk in to any situation we deal with, anything we go through. He said, I've commanded the ravens. That word command means to have an appointment. See, all of us will have an opportunity every day to place God somewhere. We set God at a place to work in our lives. It's not a lottery. It's not a bingo tent. It's not just luck of the draw. It's not some power ball that we go through. It is a placement of God in our lives every single day that positions us for the blessings of God. That's why the scripture says in Psalm 133, behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard that went down to the skirts of his garments as the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended on the mountains of Zion. For there, everybody say there, for there the Lord commanded the blessing. Where does he command the blessing? He commands the blessing on people that come together in unity, that follow his word, that hear what he's saying and do his will. That's where he appoints a blessing. Number two, putting God first demands that I do not allow circumstances to be my main focus. It's interesting in Matthew 14 when Jesus is confronted by the disciples looking at a hungry mass of people. And Jesus simply says, what do you have? And they simply respond with, we only have five loaves. And two fish. And then they add a little extra. But what are they among so many? Jesus simply says to the very small snack in comparison to the masses, bring them here to me. Put them in my hand. That's why the Lord said, In verse 12 of 1 Kings 17, she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin, a little oil in a jar, and see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. Now, everybody here tonight, I'm going to give you a recipe for bread. You ready? Over this pulpit right now, you didn't expect this tonight. 
Nobody got ready for church tonight and said, I think I'm going to go because I'm going to get a good bread recipe tonight. Tim Gaddy's going to give you a great recipe for bread. You ready? Everybody, if you're taking notes, this would be a good time to fire up that pen right now. You ready? Here's a great recipe for bread. Flour, oil, and God. Flour, oil, and God. I need provision, Brother Gaddy. I've got a recipe for you. Flour, oil, and God. I need a miracle, Brother Gaddy. I've got a recipe for you here tonight. Do you have some flour? Get it out of the kitchen. You got a little bit of oil in the cruise? Get it out of the cruise. Flour plus oil plus God means bread for a long time. That's a bread recipe. You say, well, what's a recipe for a miracle? Your circumstances plus God. My reality plus God. Oh, I want someone to hear this tonight. Your situation doesn't have to get better for God to give you a miracle. He just needs what you've got put in his hand. What is your reality? What is the thing going on in your life right now? Are you willing to take it and put it in the hands of God? My circumstances plus God means provision. I place him first in my life, and then watch him work. Yes. Number three, there are two words which impact my decision to put God first. Everybody say God first. God first. Here are the two words, fear and first. And God's got to deal with the fear issue first before we get to the first issue. She said, prophet, I, I, I don't have much. Look at me. A little bit of flour, a little bit of oil. Now, we can read this and lose its impact. This lady said to the man of God, Sir, let me just tell you what's going to happen. I'm planning on going and making one more cake. My son and I are going to eat it. And then we're going to die. Now, I don't know how bare your cupboards are, but I've never been there before. And I thank God for that. She said, here, here, here's my plan. As far as my eyes can see, I'm making one more cake, and then I'm going to die. So no wonder Elijah said to her under the inspiration of God, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a small cake from it first. And bring it to me, and afterward, make some for yourself and your son. As I was praying for this message tonight and praying for this service, I really felt the Lord nudge me. And you know, I said earlier and kind of made, poked a little fun at that, God spoke to me at Cabot Fest. You know, most of the time, maybe this will help somebody, most of the time when God speaks to me, it is far less dramatic than you might think. Do I have anybody in here that's like that? Far less dramatic. You know, I've heard preachers my whole life get up and say, God spoke to me. Say stuff like, he's been waking me up every morning at 3.15 in the morning for six weeks, and I get up and write sermons out. (laughs) That doesn't happen for me. He just lets me sleep. I have friends, and I'm, I have to say this, I, I guess I shouldn't be like this, I'm a little jealous. I have friends that, man, God's dramatic when he speaks to them, and they have angels come in the room and, you know, breathing yellow stuff out of their nose and writing stuff on the walls, and meanwhile, I just get little impressions in my thoughts. That's mainly how God speaks to me. But as I was praying... The Lord drew me to the 13th verse of 1 Kings 17 where the prophet said to her, go and do what you're going to do, but first make me a small cake. Elijah said, your plans that you have, they're, they're all right. There's nothing wrong with the plan that you have to make a cake, but just insert God as a priority in those plans. Just put God first in those plans. 
Let me just speak tonight to someone perhaps, and I don't know who all I'm speaking here tonight, who is looking at a career change or a young adult who's looking at a college situation or someone that's looking through some sort of transitional time in your life. It could be that the Lord would show up tonight and say to you as you pray, your plans are not wrong. You're trying your best to follow after the will of God, but put him first in those plans. Insert him at the beginning of those plans and give him license to change whatever he needs. Your plans are okay, but put him first. Be open to his direction. It is fascinating that the decision to put God first has nothing to do with what's going on in the world around me or what my present state of resource is. It is simply a decision and a deliberate action in my current reality. Can I say it like this? There is not a greater time than tonight to live a God-first life. Brother Gaddy, when's the altar call for this sermon? Right now. When should we put God-first living into practice? Right now. Shouldn't we wait till we get more stuff? No. What do we have in our hand right now? How much flour, how much oil, how many fish, how many loaves. Whatever you've got, start putting him first right now. The power to put God first is already in our hand. Let me quickly come to a close. Finally, God's promise for provision in our life is simply this. Enough for the necessary. Enough for the necessary. 1 Kings 17 and 14, for thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and she did according to the word of Elijah. And she and her household ate for many days. Here's the testimony of someone that lives a God-first life. Verse 16, the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. I want you to stand with me tonight. And I'm going to ask us here in just a moment to do two things. Everybody just look right up here, please. Number one, I'm going to ask if at all possible for us not to move in and out right now, unless it's absolutely necessary, out of respect for what I believe the Lord wants to do in prayer before we leave this house. And number two, in just a moment, I'm going to ask every person in this sanctuary to step out and join me here in this altar here tonight. And we're just simply going to give our life to the Lord, those that want to, and make a declaration, God, I'm going to put you first in my life. I, I, I'm looking at people here tonight. You can't have a group this size without people that need a little bit of bread. You need God to come through in a miraculous way for your kids. You need God to step in. There's some people here tonight that you've been praying for the same thing for a long time. And there is a provider in this house tonight. There is a miracle worker in this house tonight. And we're simply on a Wednesday night going to invite him to take control. And say, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to place you first with what I've got in my life right now. I'm going to pave the way for provision. Praise God. Praise God. I wonder if you'd join me right now. Everybody in the house, would you come? Even if you're not a member, a guest of CCC, come on and join us up here at the front. You don't have to be a member of this church to respond right now. There's an anointing in this sanctuary right now. I wish you'd step close. I wish everyone that would would just step close in this altar. Praise God. Can I have somebody come and just play something on the... This music's been awesome here tonight. We're going to pray together, and I believe God's going to hear what we're saying on this Wednesday night. Praise God.
praise God. Now, I, I feel cranked up in my spirit. I, I don't know what that sounds like to you. Cranked up is probably not the best way to say it. But, Pastor, last Thursday night, I received a call at 645. I was in my house. And we had a precious couple in our church that was having a baby. Mandy had been in labor at that time for over 60 hours. And the baby still wasn't born. And uh, she was worn out, as you can imagine, ladies. 6.45, my phone rings, and it's her husband, Dennis. And he said, Pastor, would you pray with us, Emerson, who is their baby that was going to be born? He won't turn properly. And all the vital signs are decelerating right now. It's a very serious moment in this delivery room. We need a miracle. I said, let's pray right now. I said, put it on speakerphone. I want Mandy to pray with us. They put it on speakerphone. We begin to call on the name of the Lord. Now, here's the thing. Listen very closely, because this is going to help somebody right now. I did not feel a rush of the Holy Ghost. I didn't feel goosebumps. I didn't feel the quaking of the Spirit. I just knew they asked for prayer, and so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. I've been taught that my whole life. So we prayed. That was at 6.45. At 2.15 that next morning, just about seven plus hours later, I get a text on my phone, Sister Beverly, and they said, Emerson has arrived healthy. I was excited about that. That was Friday morning. Friday night on my way to a service, I stopped by the hospital and I wanted to meet Emerson for the first time. I walked into the room and Mandy, of course, she looked so tired. She'd been through all of that. And dad's there and several others are there. I walked in and got to pray over Emerson. And it was just a special, special time. Dennis looked at me, the dad, and he said, Pastor, I need to tell you the rest of the story. I didn't tell you this last night. I said, okay, hit me with it. He said, you remember you said put that on speakerphone? I said, yes, sir, I remember that. He said, we did that. And so now the prayer is going out all over the room that we're in. He said, as you can imagine, there were nurses all around that bed tending to Mandy as she's giving birth. He said, there was one head nurse standing right next to Mandy who, while we began to pray, was looking up at the monitor that showed all the vital signs decelerating. And she said, the strangest thing happened when you all started to pray. She said, I was looking at that monitor, and what started to go down started to go right back up. She said, heartbeat started to go up. Blood pressure started to go up. Every marker that talked of health started to go up. She said, I saw that with my own eyes. She said this to Dennis. She said, sir, you have to understand something. I do this for a living. I help deliver kids. That's my job. She said, but I have never seen anything like that before. And this lady who delivers kids every day that she works said to this dad, I will never forget this day. She said, I watched something happen. I don't know what that is that just happened, but I watched something happen right before my eyes. So I am stepping to this pulpit tonight to tell somebody, it's not too late for your provision. It's not too late for your miracle. It's not hocus pocus. It's not some magic potion. It's saying to the Lord right now, Lord, in the good times, I'm going to place you first. In the tough times, I'm going to place you first. When I have bread enough to eat, I'm going to place you first. But when I got a little bit of flour and just a little bit of oil, I'm going to rise up on a Wednesday night and live a God first life and watch you provide. Ha! I wish you'd reach over to someone near you right now. There is an anointing that's going to break loose when we pray for one another right now. I wish a lady would reach over to another lady and say, Lord, show yourself strong on their behalf. Come on, Mama. He's still a provider. Come on, Dad. He's still Jehovah Jireh. I'm going to put him first. I'm going to place him first in my life. Come on, young man. It's not an emotion. It's a decision. It's a deliberate decision.
to live a God first life. Come on, Capital Community Church. There's an anointing sweeping over this house. I wish there'd be an intercession that comes out of our spirit right now. Great provider, we call out to you tonight. Holy God of miraculous power, we depend on you tonight. I pray we give you license to surprise us, Lord. We give you license to step into the middle of our reality and surprise us with your hand, Lord. Oh, God. Come on, I believe it's coming. I believe that the, the jar is going to be filled with oil enough. I believe the bin's going to have more flour tomorrow morning. It's not going to be used up. It's not going to run dry. Woo! Come on, somebody. That's a word of the Lord for somebody here tonight. Put him first. Place him first. Put him first. that's beautiful that's beautiful if you feel directed of the Lord to pray for somebody else go ahead and step out let the gifts of the spirit operate right now let the word of knowledge what the word of wisdom operate in this house right now what an anointing that's helping us right now what an anointing that's picking us up right now and encouraging us thank you for your word Lord thank you for your provision Lord come on if you need a financial provision put God first in your finances you need a breakthrough in a relationship put him first in your prayer life Woo, hallelujah Hallelujah. Come on, we're going to leave this house with a word from heaven tonight. We're going to leave this house with a word from the Lord tonight. Let's place him first. Let's place him first. Pastor Jack, I just feel led of the Lord right now. If you'll allow me just, if you have a prodigal child, some child that used to serve the Lord, they're not serving the Lord as, you, as far as you know tonight. But you would like just some prayer. I, I feel led of the Lord to pray for prodigal children here just for a moment. If you've got a prodigal child, I'm not trying to shame anybody, but you're ready for a breakthrough in their life. You're ready for provision to be seen in their life. You are ready for an echo of God's mercy to sweep down to their heart tonight. I wish you'd step right down here in the middle. Can you come quickly? Mamas and daddies that represent it all over this room. Those of you that do not have prodigal children, whether you don't have kids or your kids are serving the Lord, I wish you would just join up with these ones. I, I, I think we, it'd be good if everybody had somebody to hold faith up with and say, I'm going to pray with you and I'm going to believe with you that God's going to be a provider. Can I tell you, moms and dads, keep putting God first. Keep trusting God. Keep speaking faith over your children. It's not too late. They've got breath in their body. It is not too late. Come on, I wish some of you would just gather in and lay your hands on these precious folks and believe with them for restoration for their kids right now. In the name of Jesus. God, hear our prayer on this Wednesday night. Hear our petition and our intercession on this Wednesday night. Lord, to an entire group of kids that aren't serving you right now, who aren't putting you first, let the message of God first living echo in their spirit right now. Send forth your anointing to them, I pray. Come on, in Jesus' name, let it happen right now. God, let your anointing sweep out from this room, Lord. Send forth your angels to minister, Lord.